Today's modern aircraft are a tribute to the progress made by years of research and development. Their performance, high speed, and maximum safety in the air makes them the key to our modern transportation system. Much of the progress in aviation is due to the high reliability of our modern aircraft engines. One of the most important components in these power plants is the fuel metering system which requires periodic inspection and precision maintenance. For this reason, the following two-part training series on aircraft fuel metering systems has been prepared. It is through a better understanding of these highly developed systems, your effectiveness as a professional aviation technician will be increased while improving safety in the air. In part one of this program, we will discuss the theory of energy transformation, factors which affect engine performance, aviation fuels, principles of aircraft float carburetors, their servicing and repair. To gain a complete understanding of a fuel metering system, we must first have an insight to what energy really is and how it may be transformed into power. Knowledge of this transformation is essential to understanding the basic theory of fuel metering. So let's take a moment and go back in time when dense vegetation and huge inland seas supported vast animal and marine life on our planet. In the beginning, our energy originated from the sun in the form of light and heat which reached the earth and was absorbed by animals and plant life. In time, great upheavals of the earth buried this animal and vegetable life beneath billions of tons of rock and dirt, where pressure and heat converted it into hydrocarbon fuel or petroleum, our source of today's gasoline and turbine fuel. An aircraft engine is classified as a heat engine because it mixes this hydrocarbon fuel with oxygen from the air and burns it. This combustion releases heat energy from the fuel, changing it into mechanical energy needed to turn the propeller. The actual transformation from heat energy to mechanical energy occurs when air inside the cylinders is expanded and work is done. And if we know the amount of work done in a given period of time, we can determine the amount of power contained in the fuel. One handy way of measuring power in our fuel is to consider that one pound of aviation gasoline contains approximately 20,000 BTUs of heat energy. Each BTU will produce 778 foot-pounds of work. And it takes 33,000 foot-pounds of work done in one minute to produce one horsepower. So an engine burning 12 gallons or 72 pounds of fuel in one hour should produce 565 horsepower. But an aircraft engine is only a mechanical device and is not capable of operating with 100% efficiency. So an engine burning 12 gallons of gasoline per hour will produce only about 130 brake horsepower, which gives it an efficiency rating of about 24%. Rather than measuring percent of engine efficiency, however, it is more meaningful to determine the number of pounds of fuel which must be burned in one hour to produce one brake horsepower. This measure is called the Brake Specific Fuel Consumption, or BSFC. The fuel metering system in an aircraft has a direct effect on the specific fuel consumption of an engine. Therefore, its proper management determines to a great extent 
the efficiency and safety of overall engine operation. For this reason, a number of aircraft instruments are used to monitor engine behavior in flight. These are the tachometer, the manifold pressure gauge, and the exhaust gas temperature indicator. The tachometer provides an indication of the number of power strokes the engine is producing each minute. The manifold pressure gauge indicates the pressure of the air forcing the combustible charge into the cylinders. And while this is not a direct measurement of air density, it still relates to some degree to the density of the air entering the cylinders. This indication is important to engine operation because the amount of energy released from the fuel is determined by the amount of oxygen mixed with the fuel. Consequently, anything that lowers air density decreases the amount of oxygen available for combustion. For example, when air is heated, or as the airplane gains altitude, the density of the air fed into the engine is lowered. Another factor which lowers air density is high humidity. Because water vapor displaces some of the heavier nitrogen and oxygen molecules. In either case, some of the power lost by this decrease in air density may be regained simply by using a supercharger to compress the air before it enters the engine. While turbochargers cause a slight power loss from back pressures created from the turbine, this is more than made up by the power gained with more dense air being fed into the cylinders for combustion. At this point we can see the importance of air pressure as it enters the cylinder and the compression ratio of the engine as both determine the final pressure within the cylinder after the mixture is ignited. The higher this pressure is, the more efficient the engine will operate, and thus, the more power it can develop for the amount of fuel burned. The only limit to power development, however, comes from the fuel. Here, when the critical pressure and temperature of fuel is reached, the fuel will release its remaining energy instantaneously, exploding, rather than burning evenly. This explosion is called detonation, which produces extreme pressures and heat within the engine so fast that it takes only a few seconds to bend connecting rods or burn holes in the pistons, or to blow the head completely off of a cylinder barrel. This condition may be prevented by maintaining the proper relationship between the manifold pressure and the RPM, and by using a fuel-air mixture that is rich enough to provide a slight excess of fuel to cool the cylinder heads. It is also extremely important that only the proper fuel be used, as different grades of aviation gasoline have different detonation characteristics. Now for this reason, let's take a moment to review aviation fuels and how they are formulated for optimum engine operation. Aviation gasoline is a special blend of hydrocarbon fuel that contains additives to inhibit corrosion, improve storage capability, increase resistance to detonation, and a dye added to the fuel to identify its anti-detonation rating. In general aviation, there are three grades of aviation gasoline available. The difference in these fuels is primarily the amount of the additive tetraethyl lead, which is used to suppress detonation. Grade 80 has a maximum of one half milliliter of TEL per gallon and is dyed red. This fuel is used for engines with low compression ratios and low power. Grade 100 fuel is dyed green 
With as much as 4.6 milliliters of TEL per gallon added for use in higher powered engines. A compromise fuel with the same anti-detonation rating as the grade 100 but with only 2 milliliters of TEL per gallon is called low lead 100 and is dyed blue. The Federal Aviation Administration specifies the lowest grade of fuel approved for the engine. And because of the danger of detonation, this restriction must be observed. Never use fuel with a lower rating than that approved for the engine. The anti-detonation rating or octane number of a fuel is increased by the use of more tetraethyl lead. If a fuel is used with a higher octane rating than is approved for the engine, there is a possibility that the extra lead will foul the spark plugs. Another additive in aviation fuels is ethylene dibromide. It is used to help scavenge lead deposits left from TEL. This converts lead oxides into volatile lead bromides that are scavenged with exhaust gases. Besides the octane rating of aviation gasoline, there is another factor that must be taken into consideration. This is the vapor pressure, or the pressure of the air above the fuel that is needed to hold the vapors in liquid form, or to keep it from boiling off. For example, if the vapor pressure of the fuel is 13 pounds per square inch, the outside air pressure will be less than the vapor pressure of the fuel by the time the airplane reaches 4,000 feet of altitude, causing the fuel to actually boil in the tanks and lines, creating a vapor lock. It is because of this danger of fuel starvation from a vapor lock that the vapor pressure of aviation gasoline cannot be more than 7 pounds per square inch while the vapor pressure of automobile gasoline can be as high as 14 pounds per square inch. And since automobile gasolines do not have to meet the strict requirements of aviation gasolines, they should never be used in airplanes. Not only are the additives incompatible with aircraft engines and the vapor pressure high enough that vapor locks could form, but the use of automobile gasoline in aircraft could void the manufacturer's warranty. Fuel system management and malfunctions have caused more aircraft accidents than any other one mechanical problem in the industry. Now, this is why fuel contamination is a major concern to every aviation technician. For this reason, let's take a moment to review some basic principles of fuel handling. Filters on fuel tankers or pumps should be checked regularly and replaced as needed to prevent water, rust, or dirt from reaching the aircraft fuel system from storage tanks. Sufficient fuel must be drained from all aircraft tank sumps and strainers to be sure there is no water in the tanks. Also, look at the fuel that is being drained to be sure every trace of water has been removed. When fueling an aircraft, be sure the nozzle has not picked up any dirt that can be transferred to the airplane. And keep the nozzle cover in place until the fuel is ready to flow. Remember, one of the main secrets of successful fueling is to keep the fuel clean. It is also important that only fuel of the proper octane be used and under no circumstances should turbine fuel ever be allowed to get into piston engine aircraft fuel tanks. If an airplane has been serviced with an improper grade of fuel, all of the affected tanks and lines should be drained and flushed with the proper fuel. If the engine has been run, a compression check should be performed with a detailed boroscope inspection made inside all cylinders. Now that we understand the way we can transform the chemical energy in our fuel into mechanical energy in our engine,
and we have seen the importance of the proper fuel in our aircraft, let's look at the way the fuel is measured out and mixed with the air so it can be burned in our aircraft engines. An aircraft fuel metering system must do many things. Measure the amount of air entering the engine, meter into this air the proper amount of fuel for the most efficient combustion, atomize the fuel so it can be completely vaporized, and distribute this fuel-air mixture evenly to all of the cylinders. Some of the systems used to meter the fuel have been as simple as that used on the Wright Flyer, in which raw gasoline was simply dripped into a hot channel within a water jacket. Air flowing into cylinders passed through this channel, picking up the gasoline fumes. At the other extreme, some of the larger engines have used multi-piston pumps to spray the fuel directly into the combustion chamber under high pressure, timed, and metered spray. But in our practical approach to aircraft fuel metering systems, we will not consider either of these two extremes. Instead, let's examine the float carburetor commonly used in our modern lower-powered aircraft engines. The heart of a float carburetor is the venturi. This specially shaped restrictor located in the air inlet to the engine speeds up the air as it passes through. As the velocity increases, the pressure of the most narrow point decreases. It is at this narrow point of the venturi the fuel discharge nozzle is located. This causes the amount of fuel flowing through the metering jet to be determined by the difference in pressure between the float bowl and the discharge nozzle. In this way, the amount of fuel delivered by the carburetor can be controlled by the amount of air flowing into the engine. To control the amount of air flowing into the engine, a disc-type butterfly valve is installed in the air passage immediately after the venturi. This valve is actuated by the throttle control located in the cockpit. In order to limit the fuel flow in any one position of the throttle valve, the main metering jet uses a specially shaped orifice between the float bowl and the discharge nozzle. Another component found in float carburetors is the main air blade which introduces a measured amount of air into the stream of fuel between the main metering jet and the discharge nozzle. This is used to break up the liquid fuel into tiny bubbles so it will fully vaporize as it mixes with the induction air. During operation, the venturi produces the pressure drop needed to meter fuel during cruise and full power operation. But when the engine is idling, there is not sufficient airflow through the venturi to create enough pressure drop to pull fuel from the main discharge systems. Consequently, float carburetors need a separate system for idling. During idling, the throttle valve is not allowed to close completely. Instead, it is held open just enough to allow air to enter the cylinders. This air flowing through the very small opening reaches a high velocity, producing a low pressure. This causes fuel to flow through the idle metering jet to the idle discharge nozzle located at the edge of the throttle valve. To control the correct amount of air entering the idling fuel just after it passes through the idle jet, an idle air bleed is used. This allows the proper mixture of air and fuel to be drawn up through the emulsion tube and discharged in the air through the idle discharge. This is important because the amount of air allowed to flow past the throttle valve determines the idling RPM of the engine and the amount of fuel air emulsion discharged from the idle valve determines the idle mixture, or simply, the smoothness of idling. At this point, we can begin to understand that there are two separate systems in an aircraft float carburetor, an idling system and the cruise or full power system.
Now let's see how a float carburetor operates when changing from one system of operation to another. When the throttle is moved from idle into the full open position, there is a period of time between the loss of low pressure at the edge of the throttle valve and the buildup of low pressure at the main discharge nozzle. During this time, though very brief, the engine will falter or have a flat spot in its acceleration. Consequently, almost all aircraft carburetors have a system for acceleration. This system provides a momentary enrichment of the mixture as the throttle is opened. In a simple float carburetor, this is usually a small piston pump operated by the throttle. The operation of this pump is easy to understand. When the engine is idling, the piston is at the top of its stroke and the acceleration chamber is full of fuel. As the throttle is opened, this piston moves down to force fuel through the accelerator nozzle out into the airstream. A spring on the piston shaft compresses as the throttle is opened and continues to force fuel out after the throttle has stopped moving. Now this provides a sustained discharge of fuel, lasting long enough for the engine to reach sufficient speed for the main metering system to operate. Now let's take a look at how an aircraft engine develops power. The power of an aircraft engine is determined by the number of pounds of fuel and air that are burned in its cylinders. And as the airplane goes up in altitude, the number of pounds of air taken into the engine in a given time decreases. And if the fuel flow remains the same, the mixture will become so rich that the engine will lose power. To prevent this power loss, all aircraft carburetors are equipped with a mixture control, which allows the pilot to decrease the amount of fuel flowing to the cylinders without affecting the airflow. This is often accomplished by placing a valve between the float bowl and the main metering jet, so that under any conditions except full rich, the metering can be manually adjusted by the mixture control in the cockpit. To stop the engine, this mixture control is usually pulled into the cutoff position, shutting off all of the fuel to the engine. Some helicopters whose fuel mixture management is exceptionally critical use automatic mixture controls in which evacuated bellows sense the density of the air entering the engine and automatically adjust the mixture to maintain a ratio that will produce required power. The lightweight construction of a modern aircraft engine limits the amount of heat it can tolerate in its cylinders. And too much heat will be released at full power if the mixture ratio is not enriched. To lower the temperature of the cylinder heads, the mixture is enriched at full power. This additional fuel decreases the power slightly, but most important, it absorbs heat that would otherwise damage the engine. In order to provide additional fuel for full throttle operation, an enrichment system is employed on modern float carburetors. This is accomplished on this carburetor by restricting the main air bleed with a tapered needle valve moved by the throttle linkage. When the throttle is opened wide, the air bleed is restricted and more fuel is pulled through the main metering jet. Understanding the many principles of float carburetor operation allows us to intelligently service them and ensure efficient operation. Carburetors, as with any other component of a modern airplane, have been carefully engineered for performance and tailored to the engine they fit. When servicing them, it is most important that the manufacturer's recommendations be followed in detail using only approved replacement parts specified in the service manuals. When diagnosing engine problems, be sure to consider all the other possible causes before blaming the carburetor. For example, be sure the ignition system is working properly. 
the propeller governor is correctly set and the muffler is in good condition and is not causing any unusual back pressure. Check to be sure the tachometer is accurate, giving a true indication of power produced. The air filter must be clean and properly installed so that it prevents dirt from being ingested into the engine around its edges. Also, the carburetor heat box must have no leaks and the valve should have full travel so it does not allow warm air to enter the carburetor when in the cold position. The main fuel strainer must be clean and there must be no water in the sediment bowl. And the carburetor strainer must be clean so there will be no obstruction to the flow of fuel. The throttle cable must be properly attached with both full open and full closed stops reached on the carburetor before they are reached by the throttle control in the cockpit. The mixture control must be properly connected and its full rich and idle cutoff stops reached before the control in the cockpit reaches its limits. If after checking these items and logical troubleshooting still indicates the carburetor is the source of trouble, remove it from the engine. Then take the carburetor to a clean work area where it can be disassembled to the extent necessary thoroughly cleaned and inspected, installing the required new parts. Before disassembling the carburetor, be sure that you have the latest service information and have studied it thoroughly. You will need all the proper replacement parts and any special tools required for their installation. If a repair kit is to be installed, thoroughly clean the disassembled carburetor and examine all of the passages with a light and magnifying glass. Install all of the new parts, adjusting them in strict accordance with the manufacturer's latest service information. And when reassembly is completed and all of the required safeties are properly made, the carburetor may be reinstalled on the engine using a new gasket. Connect and adjust all of the controls and check them for proper travel. And after the fuel line is attached, fill the carburetor with fuel to check for any indication of leakage. When the installation is complete, start the engine and warm it up. Adjust the idling by first setting the RPM. Then adjust the idle discharge valve until the engine runs smoothest. Clean out the engine by running it at a speed above cruise for a few seconds and return it to idle. Check the idle mixture by slowly pulling the mixture control into the idle cutoff position. If the mixture is properly adjusted, the engine will gain a few RPMs just before it dies completely. Place the mixture control back into full rich position and check the engine for proper static RPM and manifold pressure. This must be within the tolerance specified by the aircraft manufacturer and there should be no hesitation when the throttle is advanced from idle to cruise RPM either slowly or rapidly. After you are sure the engine is performing as it should, make a final inspection of the installation checking carefully for any indications of fuel leakage or missing safeties. And as always, the final part of any aircraft maintenance is an entry of the work performed in the aircraft maintenance records. This is not only required, but a real aid to anyone performing subsequent maintenance on the engine. They will know what has been done and can take this into consideration in their troubleshooting. This concludes part one. In part two, we will study the operating principles of the pressure carburetor and of two of the more popular fuel injection systems.
following is part two of aircraft fuel metering systems, a specialized maintenance training program designed to help you, the aviation technician, learn more about these important power plant components. In this portion, we will discuss pressure carburetors and two of the more popular fuel injection systems used on our modern aircraft. In part one, we learned how a fuel metering system measures the amount of air entering the engine and how fuel is metered into this air needed to produce power. Also, we discovered how a mixture control is used to maintain the mixture ratio as the air density changes and that there must be some provision for enriching the mixture under conditions of full power to remove some of the excess heat from the cylinder heads. Pressure carburetors and fuel injection systems perform these same functions in a little different way. In addition, they are less susceptible to the formation of carburetor ice than float carburetors, as well as distribute a more uniform fuel and air mixture than simple fuel metering systems. To begin with, a pressure carburetor is a closed fuel metering system with no point open to the atmosphere between the tank and the discharge nozzle. Fuel is drawn from the tank, pressurized by a pump, metered by the carburetor, and sprayed into the induction air. Any vapors which interfere with metering are returned to the tank from the carburetor. In this unit, the main metering system balances fuel and air forces. To produce a fuel pressure that will push just the correct amount of fuel through a fixed metering jet. A special venturi is mounted on the engine in such a way that all of the air entering the cylinders must flow through it. At its narrowest point, the air pressure is lowest, and this low pressure, which varies with the velocity of the air, is directed into one of the regulator compartments. Here, this air meets with impact air pressure coming from around the inlet of the carburetor, which is directed to the opposite side of the air diaphragm. These two pressures, the venturi pressure and the impact pressure, both act on a diaphragm to cause it to open a poppet valve. At the same time, fuel flowing through the poppet valve presses on a fuel diaphragm attempting to close the poppet valve. In addition, a special constant pressure discharge valve through which the fuel must flow to spray into the airstream is used to maintain a constant pressure against the fuel, regardless of the amount of fuel flowing through it. Now, with a regulated fuel pressure on one side of the fixed metering jet, and a constant fuel pressure on the opposite side, the amount of fuel being forced through the jet will be proportional to the amount of air flowing into the engine. In a pressure carburetor, when it becomes necessary to lean the mixture, the manual mixture control is merely pulled out. This pulls out a tapered needle located in a passage between the two sides of the air diaphragm decreasing the pressure difference between the two sides, causing the fuel poppet valve to partially close. This lowers the regulated fuel pressure and leans the fuel-air mixture. Some models of pressure carburetors use an automatic mixture control as well as a manual control. This automatic control employs a reverse tapered needle valve operated by an evacuated bellows. As the air density decreases, these bellows expand to force the needle to open the passage between the two chambers and automatically maintain the fuel-air mixture ratio set by the pilot. In a pressure carburetor, there is not enough airflow through the carburetor to provide a stable air metering force for idling. So, a heavy coiled spring is installed in the impact air chamber 
This spring holds the diaphragm over just enough to allow the poppet valve to open and provide fuel for idling. When the throttle is closed for idling, however, all of the fuel that is discharged must pass through the nearly closed idle valve. This valve is connected by an adjustable linkage to the throttle air valve. So they open and close together. In this type of system, the idling RPM can be adjusted simply by turning the stop screw for the butterfly type air valve. The idle mixture is adjusted by the amount the mixture adjustment holds the idle valve off its seat. In pressure carburetors, when the throttle is suddenly opened from idle to cruise or to full power, there is a momentary hesitation before there is enough air passing through the carburetor to properly meter the fuel. To overcome this hesitation, a diaphragm type acceleration pump is used to force additional fuel through the discharge nozzle. To understand how this pump works, let's look at what happens when the throttle is closed. Here, very low air pressure on the engine side of the valve pulls the accelerator pump diaphragm over and metered fuel fills the pump cavity. But when the throttle is opened, the pressure on the engine side of the throttle raises suddenly. And since it can no longer hold the diaphragm over, the fuel is forced out of the pump into the airstream through the main discharge nozzle. After this fuel passes through the discharge valve, air is mixed with it to aid in atomization. From here, it is sprayed into the airstream. The fact that the fuel sprays out under pressure into the relatively warm intake pipes reduces the possibility of carburetor ice, which is a common problem in float carburetors. Now, let's see what happens in pressured carburetors during full power operation. This is when additional fuel must be automatically metered into the air. Bendix pressure carburetors use either of two methods to perform this function. The first is an airflow type enrichment system, which has a diaphragm operated needle valve located parallel to the main metering jet. Here, metered fuel under pressure acts on one side of the diaphragm, and venturi air under pressure is on the other side. When there is sufficient airflow through the engine to demand additional fuel, both the metered fuel pressure and the venturi pressure will be sufficient to open the valve. This allows additional fuel to flow from the regulated fuel pressure chamber to the discharge nozzle. The second type of metering is a manual power enrichment system. This uses a step cut idle valve. When the throttle is in the idle position, this valve is almost closed by the larger taper on the needle. During cruise, the cruise step of the needle restricts the flow. But for full power, this needle is completely withdrawn from the orifice, creating an opening larger than the main metering jet, which will do the actual metering. As you can see, the pressure carburetor overcomes many of the limitations of the more simple float carburetor. It is not affected by the attitude of the aircraft, and it is not susceptible to the formation of carburetor ice. Pressure carburetors still have their problems, though, because their fuel is injected into the airstream at the beginning of the induction system. This causes a non-uniform mixture between the cylinders, a condition that is cured to a large extent by the use of fuel injection systems. At this point, let's examine the fuel injection systems used by our modern aircraft engines. These systems are usually a constant flow type, 
quite unlike the high-pressure direct injection systems used by diesel engines or even those used on some large radial engines during World War II. These modern systems are very similar in operation to a pressure carburetor because the air entering the engine is measured and fuel under pressure is regulated proportional to this mass of air. This regulated fuel is then metered and distributed to the individual cylinders where it is discharged from the nozzle in a constant flow just outside the intake valve of the cylinder. The air metering force is composed of impact air pressure obtained from tubes sticking into the airstream in front of the Venturi, as well as Venturi pressure taken from the most narrow part of the Venturi tube through which all of the air entering the engine must flow. The actual fuel metering force is comprised of engine pump fuel pressure acting on one side of the fuel diaphragm and metered fuel pressure on the opposite side. This arrangement helps balance out any fluctuation in the engine pump pressure making this pressure less critical. The throttle fuel valve is a variable orifice located in series with the regulator and the engine. It is connected by a rigid linkage to the throttle air valve so that when one is opened, the other is opened proportionately. In a fuel injection system, the mixture control is simply another variable orifice connected in series with the throttle fuel valve. This orifice is controlled from the cockpit by the pilot and restricts the flow without having any effect on the airflow. To shut off the engine, the mixture control orifice is merely closed, which stops the fuel flow to the engine. The main metering jet in a fuel injection system is a fixed orifice located between the throttle valve and the mixture control. When the throttle is wide open and the mixture control in full rich position, the main metering orifice restricts the amount of fuel that can flow. The balance between the air metering force and the fuel metering force is important because they determine the position of a special ball valve in the regulator. The position of this valve controls the amount of fuel pressure on the discharge side of the metering orifices. This, as you remember, is exactly opposite of pressure carburetors, which holds downstream pressure constant and vary the pressure before the metering jet. In a fuel injection system during idling, there is insufficient airflow for the regulator to be effective. Therefore, a constant head spring holds the ball valve slightly off of its seat this provides the proper fuel pressure for idling. At the same time, the position of the throttle fuel valve determines the amount of fuel that can flow under this pressure. The throttle air valve stop is designed to limit the amount of air flowing into the engine. This slows the engine RPM to idle. At the same time, the length of the connector between the air valve and the fuel valve controls the amount of fuel that can flow, providing the proper mixture for idling. Some models of Bendix fuel injection systems employ a special power enrichment system. This consists of a main metering orifice located in parallel with the power enrichment orifice which is uncovered when the throttle is wide open. When the throttle is brought back to cruise position, however, the power enrichment orifice is closed. Now that we understand how fuel is metered in a fuel injection system, let's follow the fuel as it leaves the regulator. 
At this point, it flows through a flexible line to a flow divider or distributor valve mounted on top of the engine near its center. This divider valve does two things. It distributes metered fuel to the cylinders and provides a positive shutoff for the fuel when the mixture control is placed in the idle cutoff position. These stainless steel lines of nearly the same length connect the distributor valve to the individual injection nozzles installed on the cylinder. The nozzles used in a continuous flow fuel injection system are the air bleed type. Now this means the fuel flows from the distributor valve in a continuous flow and passes through a metering orifice in the nozzle. When the intake valve opens, the low pressure pulls the fuel into the cylinder. At the same time, it causes air to be drawn into the nozzle through the air bleed hole, emulsifying the fuel as it enters the cylinder. This ensures complete vaporization of the fuel before it enters the combustion chamber. To measure the fuel pressure across these discharge nozzles, a pressure gauge is connected to the distributor valve. And since the flow through a fixed orifice is a direct function of the pressure across the orifice, these gauges are calibrated in terms of flow. Because of the type of flow measurement used in a continuous flow fuel injection system, the aviation technician must be aware of the fact that a clogged injector nozzle, while decreasing the amount of fuel flow, will actually show an increased indication on the flow meter, just the opposite of what is really happening. Today's turbocharged engines, because of their high power output and efficiency, almost always use fuel injection systems to perform fuel metering. And because these engines often have manifold pressures higher than the ambient air pressure, special provisions must be made to keep the fuel from being blown out of the nozzle through the air bleed hole. To prevent this, these nozzles are usually shrouded with the shroud connected to the turbocharger discharge pressure. The fuel flow meter used by turbocharged engines is different from meters used on normally aspirated engines. This is because turbocharged engines require a differential pressure gauge to measure the difference in pressure between the metered fuel and discharge air pressure. The main benefit of fuel injection systems over carburetors is that they provide a uniform mixture distribution. The Bendix fuel injection system we have just discussed uses both the velocity of the air and its ram pressure to establish a fuel metering force. In comparison, the Teledyne Continental fuel injection system accomplishes the same end result as the Bendix system, but uses an entirely different principle. The heart of the Teledyne Continental system is a special engine driven vane type constant displacement fuel pump. This pump is equipped with an orifice and a relief valve to provide a controlled fuel pressure proportional to the engine RPM. This positive displacement pump moves a given amount of fuel with each revolution. And if its output is restricted in any way, a pressure will build up proportional to its speed. Basically, this is what we want to do. But at this point, we have almost no control over the actual amount of fuel being delivered to the engine, because this depends entirely on the amount of restriction provided by the injector nozzles. By installing a restricting orifice in a return line between the pump outlet and inlet, 
we can control the amount of fuel delivered to the engine and the pressure of this fuel can be made to vary with the speed of the pump. This means when the orifice is large, the pump discharge pressure will be low. And when it is small, the pump discharge pressure will be high. But it will vary as the pump speed changes. The orifice installed in the bypass line around the pump is an effective way of producing a fuel pressure that varies with the engine speed. But it has one serious drawback. During low RPM conditions, it is ineffective because most of the fuel will bypass rather than go to the engine. To overcome this difficulty in the Teledyne Continental System, a relief valve is installed in series with the orifice. And during low RPM, this relief valve holds a calibrated force against the bypass fuel producing accurately controlled pressure in the system for idling. When the pump RPM increases, this pressure is high enough to hold the relief valve fully off its seat, allowing the orifice to control fuel flow. A bypass check valve in the pump allows fuel under pressure from the aircraft boost pump to flow straight through to the cylinders for starting. But when the pump outlet pressure is higher than that of the boost pump, this check valve will automatically close. Another interesting feature of this system is that fuel entering the pump from the aircraft fuel system is swirled to separate the vapors from the liquid fuel. and a small amount of fuel from the discharge side of the pump passes through a Venturi-type vapor ejector. This ejector picks up vapors released from the fuel and carries them back to the tank. So now, vapor-free fuel with a pressure proportional to the engine RPM is delivered to the fuel control unit. This fuel first passes through a mixture control. This is a variable selector valve, which in the full rich position, passes all of the fuel to the throttle. In the cutoff position, however, this fuel is routed back to the inlet side of the pump. At any position between cutoff and full rich, some of the fuel returns to the pump and some of it goes to the throttle. The throttle fuel valve used in this system is merely a variable orifice located between the mixture control and the engine. It is connected by a linkage to the throttle air valve. So, as the throttle control in the cockpit is moved, the amount of both air and fuel directed into the engine is varied. As with all of the types of pressure fuel metering systems we have discussed, controlling the closed position of the throttle air valve determines the idling RPM of the engine. And by varying the length of the connecting rod between the throttle air and fuel valves, we can control fuel flow at idle, which controls idle mixture and smoothness of engine operation. The manifold valve used by the Teledyne Continental Fuel Injection Systems not only provides uniform distribution of the fuel to the cylinders, but assures a positive shutoff of the fuel when the mixture control is placed in the cutoff position. It also incorporates a poppet valve that prevents fuel flowing to the nozzles until sufficient pressure has been built up in the valve. This assures that it is fully open and will do no metering. From this point, 
we can see that uniform lengths of stainless steel tubing are used to connect the manifold valve with the individual nozzles installed on each cylinder. And each nozzle has a very accurately calibrated orifice through which the fuel delivered by the distributor valve must pass. There are several orifice sizes used in these nozzles. Their flow range is identified by a letter stamped on the side of the nozzle. The lower the letter in the alphabet, the more fuel will be passed by the nozzle for a given pressure. An air bleed hole is also incorporated into each injector nozzle to help atomize the fuel as it is sprayed into the intake valve chamber. Turbocharged engines use the same type of injector nozzles as normally aspirated engines, except the shroud that encloses the nozzle is connected to the turbocharger discharge, or as it is properly called, the upper deck pressure. The fuel flow meter used on Teledyne Continental turbocharged engines is also a differential pressure gauge. This gauge reads the difference between the fuel pressure at the discharge nozzle and the upper deck pressure. But the greatest difference between a fuel injection system for a turbocharged engine and one for a normally aspirated engine lies in the injector pump itself. The orifice in the pump for a turbocharged engine is variable and is controlled with an aneroid or an evacuated bellows system that senses upper deck pressure. For example, if a pump with a fixed orifice were used in a turbocharged system and the throttle opened suddenly, the engine would accelerate with the fuel pressure going up before the turbocharger has time to spin up and increase air density proportionally. This will cause the engine to hesitate because of the excessive rich mixture. In comparison, if the orifice is controlled by an aneroid and the throttle is suddenly opened, the upper deck pressure will drop. This causes the aneroid to increase the orifice size, which decreases fuel pressure to the nozzles until the turbocharger increases the upper deck pressure. At this point, the aneroid will decrease the size of the orifice and increase the amount of fuel supplied to the nozzles. Servicing Teledyne Continental fuel injection systems must be done in strict accordance with the recommendations of the manufacturer. And its troubleshooting is quite straightforward. Perhaps the most common trouble with any fuel injection system is a plugged nozzle. If there is trouble with uneven running, check to be sure that all of the nozzles flow a uniform amount of fuel. Clean the nozzles by soaking them in acetone or MEK and flow them out in the direction opposite normal flow. Examine them with a light to be sure that there is no obstruction in the passages. With all of the nozzles clean and properly installed, connect an accurate pressure gauge in a T-fitting between the fuel control and the manifold valve. And with the engine running at a low speed recommended in the service instructions, check the low unmetered fuel pressure. It must be with the tolerance specified by the manufacturer. If it is not, improper low unmetered fuel pressure can be adjusted with the relief valve. Now, operate the engine at the speed recommended to check the high unmetered pressure with a test gauge. It must be within the range recommended by the manufacturer. If it is not, it can be adjusted by changing the size of the orifice. 
Be very careful when checking the high unmetered fuel pressure. Only run the engine at this high power setting for a very short period of time. Because the engine can be damaged from prolonged high power output on the ground with inadequate cooling. Adjust the idling RPM by setting the throttle stop and check the idling mixture by slowly pulling the mixture control into the idle cutoff position. There should be a slight rise in RPM before the engine stops entirely. After the system is checked for the proper unmetered fuel pressure and for the proper idling RPM in mixture, it must be test flown to check metered fuel pressure against the specifications established by the manufacturer. Pressure carburetors and fuel injection systems are intolerant of improper servicing. They are precision components and require sophisticated flow benches to calibrate them. While the aviation technician is restricted in the major overhaul and calibration of these critical systems, he is charged with the responsibility of servicing and maintaining them at their peak performance. Fuel metering systems are blamed for many faults for which they are not responsible. So before performing any maintenance on pressure carburetors or fuel injection systems, be sure that both ignition systems are operating properly. All of the fuel strainers are clean and the selector valves allow maximum fuel flow. The air filters must be clean. And the muffler must not be causing any undue back pressure. The turbocharger must be operating properly and there must be no leaks in the induction system. The propeller governor must be properly adjusted and the tachometer must be accurate. Finally, the accuracy of the fuel flow meter, which is actually the metered fuel pressure gauge, should be checked. Because trying to calibrate a fuel injection system with inaccurate instruments can lead only to frustration. Be sure that all calibration and servicing is done in accordance with the latest service bulletins and manufacturer's service information. Finally, if the recommended troubleshooting and servicing does not restore the performance of the engine, the entire fuel injection system should be returned to the manufacturer or to one of his approved service stations for complete overhaul and calibration. The purpose of this training series is to promote safety through education. And it is with gratitude that we acknowledge those who have helped in the production of this program. <laughs>